Welcome to the Nibosh Revision videos. My name is Dr Julie Riggs and I'll be sharing additional free resources for those studying the Nibosh certificate. This video is designed to complement element 7, chemical and biological health hazards and risk controls. As with all these videos, this is not designed to replace material provided by your training provider, merely to complement your existing learning. One of the main purposes of COSH assessment is to adequately control the exposure of employees and others to hazardous substances. This means that such substances should be reduced to levels which do not pose a health threat to those exposed. To understand how to protect workers, we need to understand the dose, the route of entry into the body and the health effects. We will be examining defences of the body in another video. You can also find out more about exposure rates in Understanding EH40 document, a video that's also within this series. So let's examine the model that we'll be using for this video. We will be covering dose, four routes of exposure, absorption through the skin via dermal contact, digestion via eating or smoking with contaminated hands or in a contaminated work area, inhalation, breathing in fumes, dust, fibres, vapours, spores, and injection, introducing the material directly into the bloodstream. Injection may occur through mechanical injuries from sharps. And finally examining whether the health effects are acute or chronic. So let's begin by looking at dose. A substance can produce the harmful effects associated with its toxic properties only if it reaches a susceptible biological system within your body in a sufficient concentration, i.e. a high enough dose. The toxic effect of a substance increases as the exposure or dose to the susceptible biological system increases. For all chemicals there is a dose response curve on a range of doses that result in a graded effect between the extremes of no effect and a 100% response, i.e. a toxic effect. All to substances will exhibit a toxic effect given a large enough dose. If the dose is low enough, even a highly toxic substance will cease to cause a harmful effect. The toxic potency of a chemical is thus ultimately defined by the dose, the amount of the chemical that will produce a specific response in a specific biological system. It is considered that all substances are poisonous. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates a poison. If you take water as an example, a basic requirement for human survival, it makes up 66% of the human body. Water runs through the blood and inhibits our cells. In humans, the kidney controls the amount of water and salt leaving the body by sieving blood. When a person drinks too much water in a short period of time, the kidneys cannot flush it out fast enough and the blood becomes waterlogged, causing entry of water into our brain cells, leading to brain swelling, which manifests as seizures, coma, respiratory arrest and death. Therefore the dose makes the poison. Let's understand further the four routes of entry into the body. Skin absorption. The skin may present two major routes of exposure. Many chemicals cross through the skin and into the bloodstream, such as solvents. Other chemicals can corrode the skin, causing burns and blisters. Chemicals passing through the skin into the blood, if the skin is irritated, damaged or punctured, the absorption is increased. Human skin in different areas of the body absorb chemicals at different rates. As an example, the scalp and forehead will absorb chemicals 34 to 36 times greater than that through the foot. Arms are 10 to 15 times greater than a foot and hands are 5 to 10 times greater through the foot. There are also delicate areas 
such as the scrotum skin, which will absorb chemicals 300 times greater than a foot. This is an area that was investigated in car mechanics who wiped oil from their hands onto their overalls near their groin, absorbing into the skin, resulting in a higher prevalence of scrotum cancer. We've seen a similar cancer called chimney sweep cancer, and it was initially found in chimney sweeps. This disease stands out from the rest since it was the first form of occupational cancer reported. It was first identified in 1775. The cancer was caused by an active ingredient of coal soot, which is a carcinogenic. Digestion can occur through eating or smoking with contaminated hands or in a contaminated work area. Human behaviour has a key role in determining digestion exposure. For example, some people are nail biters or repeatedly touch their mouth, both of which will increase the chances of ingesting contaminants on their, off their hands. The frequency that people touch their face is dependent on the circumstances of their work. Risks can often increase when there are no hygiene provisions such as hand washing, restrooms and separate areas to eat and drink food. A proper understanding of the importance of these factors will help in designing interventions to reduce the risk from ingesting hazardous substances at work. Inhalation As we breathe, we inhale what is in the air. If it's dust, particles, chemicals, perhaps even biological matter, they're all in the air that we breathe and they may be deposited in the lungs or cross into the bloodstream along with oxygen. Inhalation is the major way that toxic substances get into the body. The EH40 document discusses workplace exposure limits, which we explore in a different video. And finally, injection. Introducing the materials directly into the bloodstream. Injection may occur through the mechanical injury from sharps. The risks can include the transmission of blood-borne viruses such as hepatitis and HIV. Industries such as construction, healthcare, emergency services, housing associations and the beauty industry are exposed to such potential risks. There are many different parts of the body a substance can affect, including the liver. Products like xynine can make a liver inactive. Blood circulation. Benzene can affect bone marrow, resulting in leukemia. The nervous system. Products such as organic solvents and heavy metals can affect our central nervous system. Hatters and millers who were exposed to the use of mercury whilst curing pelts exposed the workers to mercury vapours ca causing neurological damage, including confused speech and distorted vision. This is a depiction within Cheshire-born Lewis Carroll's 1865 Alice Adventures in Wonderland Mad Hatter character. Carroll would have resided near the hat factory and witnessed the potential effects of mercury. Substances can also affect the respiratorial system, including occupational asthma, fibrosis and cancer. And finally, it can affect the skin, resulting either in irritation, blistering or perhaps cuts in the skin that can allow a substance to enter through the skin into the blood system. On the final part of this model, let's look at acute and chronic exposure. Acute exposure. Acute health effects are characterised by sudden and severe exposure and rapid absorption of that substance. It's normally a single large exposure. Acute health effects are often reversible. Examples of these are carbon monoxide or cyanide poisoning. Chronic exposure. Chronic health effects are characterised by prolonged or repetitive exposure over many days, months or even years. Symptoms may not appear immediately, therefore they may be latent. Chronic health effects are often irreversible. Examples are lead or mercury poisoning or indeed cancer. The EH40 document covers further information regarding workplace exposure limits. There is a further video understanding the EH40 document within this series. You can also find further information on the HSE website. 
If you have found this video useful, please like or subscribe to this channel. With positive feedback, we will continue to upload further videos to assist with your studies. Good luck with your learning programme.